Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you to you all who have the kindness of being with us and listening to our second uh, web interview. This time we have the chance to interview somebody that I do mention quite a lot into my blog posts, my articles, because um, first of all, it's quite rare when two consultants are invited together by the same client that those two consultants get along immediately. <laughs> and it was the coup de fou, at least on my side. You may have a different opinion, Jay. No, <laughs> but no. uh, it was an amazing no, no. moment. If, if you remember, it was on this deck on the roof in New Jersey with a Swiss multinational working there, um, you know, quite a few years ago already. Um, and and um, Professor Jay Rao, because it's uh, about him that I'm talking, um, is one of the, uh, how would I say that, uh, different thinkers, alternative thinkers about the way we think, consider, do, live, uh, innovation and creativity. Uh, you will hear him in a while, you know, he has this word that I love, the mythology of creativity. And in the discussion you'll, you'll, you'll have with him, you'll see that he has a very different way of looking at things. Uh, Professor J. Rao teaches in Babson and is or has been sitting on supervisory and advisory boards of big companies in Latin America, in uh, North America, in Switzerland, and in India as well. So, Jay, thank you very much for giving us your time and for accepting to be our second guinea pig <laughs> of, of these interviews. Nick and I are still learning the hard way and doing many mistakes but we hope we're going to be able one day to be decent YouTubers. <laughs> no, no, the, it's, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Nick, anything you'd like to say before we start, or should I go no, straight? Dive right into it, today. Well, Okay. Everyone. Well, um, Jay, prior, I mean, people who want to know your pedigree can easily find it on your own website, on the Babson website, on your LinkedIn profile. So let's leave it on, on the side. But uh, when I ask you, you know, what could we find uh, as a way to present who you are and not what you are, your pedigree, as I refer to, you came with um, uh, five quotes, actually, uh, that I, I, I found quite interesting. I'm not going to go through all the five, but maybe ask you, why that specific quote um, is something that resonates with you, if you agree. The, the, the first one is known, but I was, I was curious to, to see somebody like you who teaches innovation, strategy, uh, and, and creativity, choosing it. Uh, the quote is, chance, chance favors the prepared mind from Louis Pasteur. Why did you pick up that quote, what does it mean to you? So we as, we as humans, uh, kind of, we go into the future in a couple of different ways. Okay. And, and, and what is that? It's, we either go into the future intentionally or opportunistically or accidentally. Okay. That's what life is. And, but it's very hard to predict if, if we are 60%, 20%, 20%, or 30%, 30%, 40%, it's hard to predict that, okay? And as a good example will be Steve Jobs, right? And when he bought Pixar, he didn't have an idea of making movies. He wanted to sell the Pixar computer to different markets. But then he landed up make, making great movies through Pixar. He really didn't have an intention to go into music. But then all the music stealing software was happening on Windows, not on Apple computers. And that was the biggest trend at that time. And so I had to jump into making music. And 
It was at a party of a Microsoft employee. And the employee of Microsoft started talking about the product he was working on, which was a tablet. And the next day he goes back to Apple and he says, hey, Microsoft is working on a tablet. I want a tablet too. Okay. So especially those people in business, executives, even in business schools, we are forced to be highly intentional about everything. But we have to have magical visions of the future. And we have to articulate these visions of the future. And we have seven steps to get to that future. Or eight steps, whatever that may be. And that, for the most part, is garbage. Okay? And so we have to be very careful. Yes, you cannot write books. You cannot publish books. You can't write and publish academic journals if you were to say the error term, the error rate is 30%. The media would accept it. So we humans, we want to, we want to have our visionaries, we want to have our kings and queens to be amazingly predictive of the future. Right? No, that's not the way the world happens. Right? So it is that yes, we have to be intentional. The more intentional we are, the more opportunities open up. And guess what? We will get lucky in that process. But it's hard to predict. What is that percentage? So intentionality, opportunistic, and accident. And so that's why Louis Pasteur is that the more prepared you are, the chance favors favors you, the luckier you get. And so let's take an example of the Swiss uh, uh, example of Velcro. And George de Mistral, he was working on an adhesion problem. But every day he would take his dog out in the backyard and he came back with burrs sticking on his socks. But because he was working on an adhesion problem. He saw that these burrs had a little hook. That's when he created Velcro. But, but the, his mind was prepared because of that adhesion problem that he was working. So that's what I mean by chance favors the prepared mind or Louis Pasteur's. Thank, thank you, Jay. I can already see, and we'll get back to that, uh, one or two very strong points that you have, uh, the difference between prediction logic and creative logic, and we'll, we'll get back to that. And, and the second one, you know, which, which to me has been an eye-opener, it's about creating the, the mental preparedness for businesses, the culture, that that's what brings creativity and not processes and stuff like this. So thank you. Thank you for this one. Let me ask you uh, out of the six, you've sent me another one that uh, I like very much. And once again, was surprised to see um, a professor of strategy and innovation come with this one. Uh, th that quote says, the extremes are toxic, except knowledge. It's coming from Margaret Mead. Why did you choose that one? Oh, this, this comes from my mentor, uh, the son-in-law of Margaret Mead, J.B. Kasarji. He was right outside my office for 24 years, and I, I got lucky. <laughs> See, that, it was not intentional. We were just put together, right? And, and so these are discussions I've had with him for, for two decades. Yeah. And... and it's not just in the area of business, right? Today, we have tested the limits of capitalism. The United States pushed the limits of capitalism and how toxic it can be. And if you push the limits of socialism, it's the same problem. And if you push the limits of religion, again, they get toxic. And so, that is very much applicable to business as well. And when I work with companies, 
and I sit in executive meetings, and if all decisions are being made only from a financial lens, it is toxic. If you push only the shareholder agenda rather than the stakeholders, today we have landed up with all of those extremes to where we are today. And that is where, for example, finance has amazing risk management tools for current cash flows, for current businesses. But finance is highly inadequate when it has to think about the future and it has to deal with uncertainty and ambiguity. And so using only financial tools for all strategic decision-making or, or funding innovation is toxic. Like you will fail if you do that. So it's, it's much more kind of a nuanced mixture, a variety of different types of thinking. But just it's not just from finance, but from, from strategy, from technology, from, from culture. Right? And it's that somewhere in that middle is where kind of we, we in fact create great innovation and, and entrepreneurial leaders. Thank you, Jay. If I may, just the last one, and then I'll leave you off the hook. <laughs> the The last one was uh, also interesting. It's closer to your to your field, but I, I was curious as why you think so. Um, it says um, incremental improvements dash innovations are for losers. I don't know who wrote that one. Maybe it's you. What do you mean by that? No, I think, let me correct you on that, okay? When I go into companies, when I work with, with uh, leaders inside companies, they have been brainwashed. They have been brainwashed by consultants and academics. parties okay? and media as well, that Everything has to be disruptive. Everything has to be radical. Everything has to be breakthrough. Okay? All innovation is only either disruptive, radical, or breakthrough. That's not true at all. Okay? And many times, they, they kind of disparagingly look down upon incremental improvements incremental innovations. And that it's in fact these, it's these leaders and consultants and, and academics are the ones who kind of say that incremental is, is for losers. I don't. And if you look at the reality, and Elon Musk is very clear on this, says all great innovations come out of lots and lots of in, incremental improvements. In fact, without incremental, there is no radical. iPod 1 was not a hit. iPod 2 was not a hit. iPod 3 was not a hit. But iPod 4 was a hit. People forget history. But to get from iPod 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, there were lots and lots and lots of incremental changes, incremental improvements. So similarly, they created a product, Apple created a product called iTools, where you could have your own email, your own web, web page, and, and create, build your, own, you know, build your own things and storage on the internet. It was a failure. Then they kind of improved on it and then created a product called .Mac. And again, it was a failure. And again, they kept improving on that and then made it into a product called Mobile Link. That's a failure. But when, then they improved upon that and made a product called iCloud. It's a super hit, right? But without those incremental improvements over a 10 year period, you wouldn't have that product. Right? So it's that 
light of that deep understanding in this very surface buzzwordy thinking that we have to be very careful about. Okay, so that's where I say, look, the more you do incremental, the easier radical becomes. The faster you do incremental, the easier radical becomes. And it gives people confidence to stretch and do better things because of that fast incremental improvement. Some of the best companies in the world understand this. In fact, they put 70% of their budgets for incremental. Only 20, 30% is for radical. If we understand the media or the executives or the academics, we would somehow think that incremental is nothing, but radical is everything. So if we want to go back to the basics. That balance, again, what is that balance? It's not always clear between radical and incremental. Just a question, thank you for that, Jay. And now launching ourselves into the many questions and challenges uh, that uh, provocations that Nick and I have for you. Maybe just building on that very last point, and thank you for clarifying uh, my understanding. That was wrong, obviously. Um, is that aligned or in line with something I hear you say a lot about the fail fast, fail cheap, and fail smart? Would you call that part of the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, um, innovation? Where would you put the fail fast, fail smart, fail cheap? Is that radical or is that incremental? It, it, it can be used in both. Okay, yeah. It's, it's an agile way of doing things, okay? Because all improvement, you can roughly kind of roughly classify into three buckets, okay? And that is risk, uncertainty, and ambiguity, okay? Because when we say the word innovation, right? The word innovation has become highly abused, highly misused, highly overused in the last 10, 15 years. So we have to be, again, very careful when we, when we use the word innovation. And the purpose of innovation is to change the game in the market or to create value to society. That's the purpose of innovation. And you can change the game in the market, the product innovation, process innovation, marketing innovation, business model innovation, or disruptive innovations. So there are many ways you can change the game in the market. But there's one thing that's common to every form of innovation. At the core of every innovation is structured problem solving. And when we say structured problem solving, it has two components, problem understanding, solution understanding. Problem definition, solution definition. Problem is about who, where, why. Solution is what and how. But when we think about problem solving, there will always be known variables and unknown variables, whether it is marketing, market unknown, or technology unknown, or competitive unknown. So you will always have known and unknown variables. We have data from iPhone 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? And you have a spreadsheet and you make decisions based on spreadsheet. You analyze and then act. So that's risk. Whereas when there are unknowns, it's uncertainty. You need to create data when there is no data. You need to act, create data, and then analyze. Okay? And so this notion of going into the future, either analyze and act, or act and then analyze, is one is for risk management, the other one is for uncertainty navigation. So this fail fast, fail cheap methodology is for uncovering unknown variables. How quickly are we learning the competitive environment around us? Okay. For whether the technology will work or not in the absence of data. So knowing those two methodologies is very useful. Jay, maybe, maybe a last question, if you, if you don't mind, Nick, uh, you, you may have as well the willingness to jump in. But just to clarify also, I'm thinking of several customers, uh, clients we work with, 
uh, using um, as, as a guideline the, the book that I'm sure you, you heard about, the uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, it, it seems that the elegant way you, you, you summarize the innovation, if I got you well, structured problem solving. Uh, would you say this is something which is in line with the overall philosophy of, of the Blue Ocean Strategy? Because many people believe it's just about white sheet of paper and 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 what I hear you say, no, 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 guys, it's about collecting data when there's no data. It's about understanding what implicit unconscious problems our customers have. Uh, it's about trying to see how to respond. So my question is how, how, how similar and how different is, is your approach and your, your own philosophy about innovation and, uh, and um, creativity? You know, in a few so, words. Yeah. If you go deep into the notion of blue ocean strategy, there is something called value curves. Yeah. Okay. And in, in, implicit in the value curves are the notion of how customers make trade-offs and decide on what is valuable for them. And the very first, even before the word blue ocean strategy was created, it was called value innovation. And our business publishing said, nobody is going to read this book if you call it value innovation. So let's call it blue ocean strategy. Okay. So and that's how the solution strategy are value curves, value innovation, and an understanding of how humans make payoffs when they buy products and services. It is structured problem solving. The relation is a bastard. And at the heart of value curve understanding is a statistical technique for conjoint analysis. That's how you extract the notion of how we humans make trade-offs between different variables. So if, if you only speak the word blue ocean strategy and don't understand value curves and the statistical technique called conjoint analysis behind it, then it is pure buzzwords. But opportunities can be found in blue oceans and as well as red oceans. If you kind of, if you really think about Apple, Apple is never first for anything, okay? They were not the first MP3 player. They were not the first tablet, okay? They were not the first smartphone. They were not the first home speaker, okay? We're always playing in red oceans. So again, we have to be very, be very careful because today what has happened is we create MBAs, masters in buzzword accumulation. That's what it has become. Okay. And so we have to be very, very careful when media and publishing houses and marketing people you have to, are, they make money only through buzzwords. Academics and consultants make money through buzzwords. Isn't it? So I would be very, very skeptical when somebody uses the word blue ocean and they don't understand value curves or even worse, they don't understand the statistical tool that gives rise to value curves because embedded in that methodology is another structured problem solving technique called the TRIZ, T-R-I-Z, TRIZ. Which, which variables do you Pull. Which variables do you eliminate? Which variables do you add? Which variables do you kind of keep the same? This is structured problem solving. Now, if I may, Nick, and, and then I'll shut up. Just a last quick one. Just, uh, um, but, but Jay, I find this very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, your explanation. Now, if you go to the 
you know, the example that is being used as the symbol of blue ocean, the famous Cirque du Soleil. I, I can't believe that they did all these researches. You know, the, the story, at least the legend has it that they were street artists who gathered success and off they went. So how do you, how do you um, counterbalance this with, with what you just explained? So we as academics, we are fantastic in trying to put stories into our models. We create models and then we put stories into it. Clayton Christensen, rest his soul, he passed away last, last year. He, he actually does the opposite. How do you build theories? You build theories from stories, not the other way around. You build models from stories, right? So we have to be very careful when we have a model and try to explain the whole world through that model. Models and frameworks are very much necessary for us to kind of have some semblance of how the world may work and to kind of make sure that we have some intentionality about how we go into the future, right? So they're very useful, but we have to be very careful if we only have a very few lenses when I say a lens to the world is what frameworks and what methodologies are you using to go into the future, right? So these are all tools and methods. So I am skeptical of any anybody who takes one model and tries to plaster that model for everything to explain all phenomena. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Very compelling. <laughs> Nick, I'm done with the session of torture of Jay. Up to you now. <laughs> well, if you, I want to continue on in the same vein because I think it's it's fascinating. I think what we're beginning to talk about, and it's a subject I'm passionate about, is that there are some really unuseful myths around success and innovation. And it's not even, you know, some cult consultants may be con accused, you know, of, of taking a model and then stuffing everything into their model. I, I absolutely agree that that does happen. But but it's, I was thinking as you were speaking also about um, uh, Nicholas Taleb in his book, The Black Swan talks about the other major fallacy, which is we tend to look at success stories and ignore the graveyard of all the companies that did similar things and failed. And I'm curious to hear your take on that, Jay, the untold stories of failure that are part of this whole process. And, and, and uh, um, another very good colleague of mine, uh, Mike Roberto, uh, he's also very vocal about this, uh, is that we, we make two mistakes, right? Number one, we don't sufficiently analyze failures. That's the first mistake we make. And the second mistake we make is that we take the wrong lessons from success. Okay. So not only are we success obsessed, right? But well, these are the other two buckets we, we really don't kind of understand well. We don't pay attention. And so we, that's the first step is that, yes, we need to really understand failures and go deep into failures. And, and so, yeah, there are many of, of, often quoted, you know, famous people who say, hey, thousand times, you know, I found 999 ways not to create a light bulb. And failure is built into that invention and innovation and analyzing these failures, that constant learning that happens, uncovering of unknown variables is through that failures. Right? But as I mentioned before, the, the wrong lessons from success, that, oh, 
he or she created this business model. It was a vision that somehow magically transpired or came to me in a dream at four in the morning. So you have a lot of these type of mythologies. And so, yes, we have to make sure that it's, it's balance. There are way more dead companies than alive companies. <laughs> That's the first thing we have to remember. And, and, and so, and there have been major pioneers who never made it. They were on the wrong, the right track. There were many, many inventors, but they were not in, innovators. So innovation is the scaling of invention. Innovation is the scaling of creativity. We are all creative. Mm. Uh, Edison had about a thousand twenty-three patents or something like that. Okay, some number like that. But only twenty odd of them were commercially successful. Mm. Okay. So built into that funnel of failure is is the ratio of what becomes successful. So it's the same thing when you go from a startup to a scale up to a large company, there's a lot of collateral damage of lots of companies dying. And very few companies scale and emerge victorious. And we only analyze those, <laughs> the few that have scaled up. And it's uninteresting, all the, all the in the journey, out of six million companies, only in the U.S., only eighteen thousand of them have more than five hundred employees. Only three percent of them have more than a hundred employees. It's a tiny number. Okay, so most companies die. It doesn't mean they're not creative, they're not not inventive, but they didn't scale. So, Jay, how, how, how do you know the difference? And let me just sort of uh, uh, flesh out the question a little bit more. Uh, earlier, you said uh, we talked about being intentional. If you're intentional, there are more opportunities. And in some of those opportunities, you will get lucky. And the phrase get lucky really struck me because I'm thinking about the guy. There's a casino just down the road here. The guy goes into the casino thinking, I'm going to get lucky. Now, there are situations where he will be lucky. Great. There are situations where he will just be statistically as unlucky as anybody could tell him he's gonna be and he's gonna lose all his money, but it's obvious. So the first metaphor is as a leader, how can you tell that you're the person with the gambling problem and you're not gonna get lucky and it's clear all the indicators are saying, stop work on this project, stop spending money on this. And, and the connected one is, is what about companies just as sort of a follow on? there's kind of systemic unluckiness you should get out you're not good at this and you need to see the signs but there's also companies where um it's almost the opposite of getting lucky uh there is a there is a crisis a catastrophe a real instance of real bad luck wasn't your fault and sometimes companies can turn that around i'm thinking did you remember nokia there was a, a chip factory burned down in the early 2000s and they were able to capitalize on that piece of really bad luck that hit the entire industry and turn it into a competitive advantage. So I kind of want to dig more into the importance of luck, the way we humans think about luck, the way our brains are very badly designed to really sort of intuitively know when we're going to get lucky and when we should give up. But what, what are your thoughts about all of that, Jay? So there's a very popular program in the U.S. called How I Built This. Okay. And the 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 person uh, who created this program is Guy Raz, and he interviews all these superstar entrepreneurs who built big companies. And in every interview, he asks the same question to these entrepreneurs, and it's about luck. How much do you attribute your success to luck? And the responses are highly predictable. Okay? These Entrepreneurs, I mean, very successful entrepreneurs. Most of them, it's upwards of 50%. Okay. And you can kind of roughly summarize as hey, being in the right place at the right time in the right network. And, and Steve Jobs himself, in his very famous Stanford speech, he said, I stumbled upon many things, right? 
And so, yes, the entrepreneurs, the, the, the great in, in innovators or inventors, they will tell you when they got lucky. But again, we as academics and consultants and, 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 and media, we don't want to hear that. We humans don't want to hear that. We want to endow entrepreneurs and with superhuman abilities that they are visionaries, that they somehow magically had abilities much better than anybody else. Right? That's human nature. We want our kings and queens. We want our superstars. We want our athletes. We want our film heroes to all be endowed with these amazing capabilities where luck is completely out of the picture. But that's because we humans are bad statisticians. <laughs> We're just terrible statisticians. And of course, Daniel Kahneman has talked a lot. Amos Tversky, they have talked a lot about how terrible statisticians we are as humans. And so that's why this is linked to that thing that Didier first asked, is that how much is intentional, how much is opportunistic, how much is, is luck? And, and it's hard to predict that, that, that ratios. Oh. And I think we can, if we dig deeper, I think we humans, we may not like our answers. <laughs> Oh, thank yep. you. Didier. Perhaps just one final question then on that. There is um, um, I'm sure you, you, you know, uh, uh, Jay, there was an interesting and quite um, provocative paper a few years ago uh, um, by Henderson, Reyna and Ahmed that looked at all these companies that uh, Jim Collins and others had said were you know, built to last. And they went through, um, uh, I'm looking at the article, 230,000 companies and looked at them statistically to see how many of them were actually doing something um, uh, remarkable. And they said that um, they found that 287 of them, which were actually identified as high performing companies, of those only about a quarter were actually doing something remarkable. The others statistically looked like mediocre firms catching lucky breaks, the market going up or price resources going down. The, again, does that yeah. fit with your vision? Absolutely, absolutely. Ever, ever since the Fortune founded list was created, more than 2,000, 3,000 companies have been on that list at least once. There are only 50 companies have been on that list every year for 50 years. Okay. A small number. Okay. And if you take the average age of these companies, the, uh, in general, the average age of a Fortune 500 company used to be around 60 years in the 1960s. Now it's around 30 years and it's going down. Okay. And so if you look at the average age of these 50, 51 companies, which have been on that list every year for 50 years, that average is 118. So these small handful of companies have beaten out the market, not by one six, not by one sigma, not by two sigma, but by more than three sigma. Right? And so, again, if you go deeper and look at those small handful of companies, many of them have been in, uh, you know, oil, uh, natural, you know, all natural resources, and they've had huge monopolies and all kinds of stuff. So that number becomes even smaller. So the ability for companies to reinvent themselves is very low, very, very low. IBM has reinvented itself like three, four times in over a hundred year period. Procter & Gamble has reinvented itself maybe three, four times in a 150 year period. Microsoft has only reinvented itself once, but not with a deep abyss, like Apple went through a deep abyss, right? So Nokia, and in fact, reinvented itself for 150 years. But then they said, you know what? Let's get out of everything and only focus on telecom and driven purely by Wall Street. They lost their diversity of investments. And when there was a hiccup in that one particular business of theirs, they were gone. And so they're now back to one business, which is 
networking, that's it. So in the progress, companies would hedge. They would be much more diversified, but Wall Street doesn't like it. So they've been pushing them to be intense, intensely focused, which means there is no diversification, which means your ability to manage cycles and go into the future by disruptive waves is much lower today than it used to be 50 years ago. So is this one of the keys then, Jay, to diversify, almost to hedge, to make sure that you have... But, but Wall Street doesn't like it. Okay? Wall Street doesn't care if you're alive or not because they can move cash very quickly from your com company to another company. But if you have physical assets, you can just divest overnight okay, from one industry to the other industry. So many companies in the past were highly diversified, but Wall Street doesn't like that. That's fascinating because that flies in the face of another myth we hear constantly, which is focus all your effort, all your investment on one thing, believe it, and you can do it. And you're kind of saying the reality is the opposite. Again, we have to be very careful about that. There is no one formula for success, okay? Because again, we love to sell a single formula, isn't it? That's our general, hey, give me a formula, I'm gonna go and apply it. So, but if you look at very carefully, the German Mittelstand, the German Mittelstand, and also the Swiss, there are many great Swiss Mittelstand as well. They are intensely focused but they're also amazingly good at customer intimacy. They understand customers much deeper than anybody else. They spend more time with customers than any other, other normal company. They have deep product expertise and technology. They have an amazing number of partners. Right? And they live long. Okay? So yes, there are companies who are able to do that, who have that ability to do that. But the bigger and bigger you grow, diversification will help you rather than focus, okay? When you're a monkey, so I teach this course called Leading Innovation in Gorillas, Chips, and Monkeys. So when you're a monkey, a small company, you, all you need is a niche market, a small market, and you're happy. When you become a chimpanzee, that's not sufficient. You need some level of diversification. But if you're a gorilla, if you want to be a massive gorilla, you need much larger diversification. But of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. So what I would always be very cautious about is <laughs> one formula for success. And there are many roles to have it. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Nick, do you mind me to ask a question or are you? No, please go on. Okay. Uh, you know, prior to, to go maybe into a second sort of a large theme, which is around the disruption economy, which is around the instability, the VUCA world that we are all in, I'd like to sort of summarize uh, because I think this, this first part of this interview was already very rich and maybe offering to summarize the, 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 the viewpoints of two experts or two people who live in worlds that are, that need to be a creative and innovative, innovative, and, and just summarize what you call the mythology of creativity, but also ask Nick, as most of you know, who are listening to us, Nick, uh, other than being a consultant and a university professor in management, is uh, also and most of uh, a very uh, an excellent conductor. So classical music has no secrets for him. So I'd like to I'd like to be curious to maybe let you start first, Jay, and then have you react, Nick. I ask you to be in the skin of the interviewee for a while and see does that make sense in your world as well of classical music? Would you support what? Um, you know, the, what uh, Jay sees as myth. And, you know, for me, it's more of a summary of everything you said so far. So if, if, if I were um, to ask you, uh, Jay, so what are the myths of creativity? What would, they, what would you say? Maybe the, the three critical myths that, you know, the caveats that we have to be very careful at 
what should people leave this interview with in their minds, in your view? Yeah, uh, today, all leaders, all executives want their people to be creative. They want them to be innovative. Okay. There's no executive who says, oh, we don't want people to be entrepreneurial. So the question then is, how do you kind of make people more creative or more innovative? Right. And then we ask the question, okay, what, what type of activities or what are you helping people with in terms of them becoming more creative or innovative? The, the usual answers are very predictable. Well, we did a two-day seminar on design thinking. We kind of did a bunch of activities on dropping an egg from a two-story building or you know, going away to Thompson Island and going from one tree to the other. Uh, you know, these activities. And but the challenge is when you go back to the office on Monday morning, Wednesday, with all these activities, you are no more creative. You are no more entrepreneurial. You're, the, you're going back to the same, same kind of work environment. So, how, but this begs the question, how do we really become creative? We are all born creative. We all have creativity inside of us, right? But they, businesses, executives, leaders want us, want their employees to be creative from a business perspective, right? From, from applying their creativity to their industry, their competitive challenges. And that's where we need to really understand how some of the greatest entrepreneurs and innovators became creative or, or we attribute creativity, right? One of the most popular companies in the United States is Southwest Airlines, which is generally regarded as the granddaddy or grandmommy of low-cost airlines. If you take Ryanair, EasyJet, or any of the low-cost airlines in Europe, they will all say, hey, we were trying to copy Southwest Airlines. Okay. If you go back and dig his at his history, Southwest Airlines magically was, they did not come up with, voila, we're going to create something so out of the box. In their own history, they were copycats. They went and stole all the ideas from Pacific Southwest Airlines. And this is where, Nick, your comment goes, Pacific Southwest Airlines died, but Southwest Airlines survived. But Southwest Airlines had copied all their operations from Pacific Southwest Airlines. Okay. So it's that survival bias, isn't it? And so, again, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, say, uh, Henry Ford, he didn't wake up one morning and stop ran saying, Eureka, I found my assembly line. No, he was at a slot looking at all the animals going on a conveyor uh, you know, line and said, oh my God, I can do this for my cars. Okay. So when we ask leaders and executives and say, who are creative people? Who do you think are most creative? The most common answer we get globally are artists. Or just like Nick, they say, hey, painters, sculptors, musicians, they are the ones who they say are creative. And then you go dig deeper into how they became creative. Right? That's where you find out the truth is that, you know, Shakespeare did not magically come up with these stories that are so fantastical. Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet was not an original. Hamlet was not an original. Macbeth was not an original. The Merchant of Venice was not an original. Othello was not original. They were all copied. Yes, beautiful, flowery language and embellished it. Beautiful, fantastic. 
Walt Disney copied like crazy. He went to Tivoli Gardens in, in Denmark when he wanted to really create Disney World in California. And he kind of laid out the whole picture and then copied it. Right? So the famous surrealist painter, Frida Kahlo, the Mexican painter, the parents knew that she was very creative. She had great talent when she was very young, but she never had any formal training in painting. So at the age of 13, they bring in a teacher for Frida Kahlo. And the teacher looks at the work of Frida and says, oh my God, this is great. You have amazing talent, you are very creative. But then he says, stop being original. Copy the masters and you will become even more creative. So copying is the starting point for creativity. The more you copy, the more creative you get. The faster you copy, you will find your originality. You will find your uniqueness. You will find your own signature. But the starting point is copying. But the word copying is a taboo when it comes to business. Oh, you have to have a unique customer value composition. You have to be amazingly unique. From the day one, I have to magically be unique. Okay? That's garbage. You can't just sit at the, an executive table and say, we will find our uniqueness tomorrow. Okay? So there is a journey to find your uniqueness. There's a journey to find your, your signature the mark that you're going to leave in the world. Yes, there are companies who found it. Ikea, Lego, or, you know, Aldi or Trader Joe's. Yes, they found their signatures. They found their uniqueness. And they are milking that uniqueness. Right? If you were to take a bank, how unique are you with your products and services? You're not really unique. So, there's power in that copy, but we are obsessed with being unique. So that's the disconnect that exists between how do we get to our uniqueness without that copy? I'm perhaps gonna surprise uh, both of you and maybe our listeners by agreeing emphatically with, with Jay. This last point for me in, in terms of the art, the world of art, and so I'm conductor, but also composer. Um, the idea that you have to be unique and original, that myth is one of the most misunderstood uh, and the most powerfully destructive in, in the world we work in. If you look at any of the great, the great uh, masterpieces all the way up into the present, you, Mozart's first symphony sounds like Haydn, he's copying. Beethoven's first symphony sounds like Mozart, he's copying. Brahms' first symphony sounds like Beethoven. Even Schoenberg, the early works that sound like Brahms. This, there used to be a sort of a journeyman artisan. You learn the craft, you learn the trade. Don't, you, you can, you're gonna be original, but first you have to master the craft. And I think for me as, a, as an artist, that's one of the, the biggest myths about creativity. Creativity is a muscle and you, 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 you work that muscle by copying, by imitating the greats, by trying to understand their mind, their thinking, their work. So that completely agree, that's the first one. For me, I would add two more just as a provocation, but they're connected to what you said, Jay, myths in, in my domain about creativity. The second myth about creative artists is you have to suffer. You have to be alcoholic and divorced and you know, your life has to be tragic to produce things of, of, of value. And it's right and wrong at the same time. Um, people who are passionate enough to spend their whole life trying to do something usually do suffer. You have to make trade-offs, uh, sometimes personal, others. So you have to sacrifice things for your art. But where, where, where it is true, if you want to do something amazing, creativity, coming back to the muscle you need to work, you have to make a sacrifice. If you want to have a fantastic body, you have to go to the gym every day. If you want to be a creative artist, and my father is an author, he gave me the three rules of creativity very early. He said, the first one is you have to write every day. Okay, every single day, it doesn't matter how long, but every single day you have to write. But the second thing is you have to accept deep in your soul that almost everything you write will be garbage, absolute garbage. And the third rule is cultivate your taste 
So if occasionally you get lucky, you stumble onto something that is not garbage, you keep that and keep throwing away everything else. That's suffering. That's suffering to be humble enough to say, I'm going to write every day and I'm going to throw away everything that is not at the highest possible standard. So that, that notion, you do have to suffer, but you have to suffer in the work, not you know drinking and, and womanizing. That's, that suffering is interesting, but doesn't help the quality of, of the art, really. And the third one I would, I would add, which is also links, I think, back to business, is you have to be profound. You have to be deep. You have to, you know, if you think about Marcel Proust writing uh, A la recherche du temps perdu, 27 volumes, this incredible novel. He knew when he was starting it, he was writing a great French novel. Okay, that exists. Uh, people like Proust, I think, sat down to write something profound. But look at uh, J.K. Rowling, look at Harry Potter. It's incredibly creative, incredibly successful. Is it profound? I don't know, she touches on some deep archetypes and themes and symbols, but I don't think she sat down and thought, I'm going to write something deeply profound. It's, it's wrong-headed, I think. It's, it's up to the audience, it's up to the consumer to go back to business, to decide. You, you need, instead of being original, to try and do something good and to learn what good looks like. You have to work hard at what you're doing, and maybe what you create will transform an industry, will completely transform the world, but you can't sit down with that intent. That's, it's, it's the wrong way around. The, the market will reward you and say, you transform the world if you do, but it's more about trying to do something that works. That, 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 and as you were saying, building, 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 slaving away. So. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, let, me, let me pick up on the word you used. You, you use the word passion and you use the word suffering. Okay. There is again, there is this mythology in entrepreneurship. We say, oh, follow your passion, you will never work a day in your life. Okay. Or follow your passion, you'll build your company. Again, maybe true, may not be true. Right? Because there may not be a market for your passion. Also, if you go deeper into the word passion, what is the root of the word passion? Where does that word come from? It comes from French. It's passion. And passion in old French is suffering. Okay? So if you have to master something, there is going to be a painful suffering. You know, you can become a great conductor all night. Right? And it was hours and hours of suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so we, we do become passionate if we have suffered for something. Right? So Pixar. Pixar is very clear when they hire people. They say, we, we, we hire people who, who have demonstrated mastery. Mastery in anything, it doesn't matter. It could be juggling balls, or it could be fly fishing, or it could be skateboarding. It doesn't matter because that mastery, the journey to mastery is that overcoming of failure, overcoming big setbacks. Right? And, and that for that journey of journey towards mastery. Right? So gets thrown around, the word passion gets thrown around very kind of uh, somewhat carelessly in the in the world of entrepreneurship. And and we have to be very careful with that. It's a passion is an outcome. It's not an input. Many people think it's an input. It's an outcome of, of the lot of turmoil and an outcome of having gotten pat, pat on the back or progress. Every time you progress, somebody is patting you on the back. And that gives you that, hey, oh, maybe I'm getting good at this. Ah, maybe I am progressing. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jay, uh, for, for that part. If you allow me to move to the disruption economy side of things, the VUCA world, uh, you name it. Um, What's your actual view? What are actually your views about, about the, the, the world we are living in, the challenges awaiting for us, 
um, maybe the hopes that you have. If I were to ask you to work uh, for a few moments as a business futurist, what would you say, Jay, before we move on further into another topic that I would like to hear is how, how should companies deal with the VUCA world? But first question, how do you see where we are at the moment? I think well, there's no doubt the pandemic is something that we, none of us in, at least in our generation, we have felt nothing like this. The previous generations, they went through world wars and, and the disruptions and, and, and migration and things like that, but we haven't. So many leaders are tasting this VUCA for the first time in a global level. And so the term VUCA has been around for decades. It started in the 50s and, and only now people are very conscious that we are living through it. <laughs> and so yeah, certain industries, financial services, there have been downturns, and, but not, nothing to this extent. So if you, were, if you look carefully at this term VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, the term that is missing there is risk. <laughs> the word risk is missing from the book. But if you go and ask companies, okay, pre-pandemic, before the pandemic, what was the most common word that executives use or leaders use in your company? The response is very predictable. It's not uncertainty, it's risk. Risk is the most common word, okay? And that's when I asked the question, is risk and uncertainty the same? And, and I have asked this question to financial services companies, insurance companies, and less than one or 2% of people understand the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Risk is the known world. Risk is the past. Risk is history. We have data. Data from Corolla, Toyota Corolla for 30 years. And you don't have to be a genius to tell me there's going to be a new model of Toyota Corolla coming next year. Any ask can do that. That's risk management. But uncertainty navigation is I don't have data. Ambiguity is, I don't even, I didn't even know that this was an important variable. So the known known is risk, spreadsheet-based decision-making. I know the variables, but, you know, we never, we never had negative oil, oil prices. We knew how to manage $100 a barrel of oil. We knew how to manage $60 a barrel of oil. Yeah, we kind of knew how to manage $30 a barrel of oil, but never negative 26 and when 20 years ago, when interest rates in Japan went negative, nobody knew how to manage that situation. And so today, it's not sufficient to be just a risk manager, but you have to be also a very good uncertainty navigator. That's what we call as entrepreneurial leaders, right? Not just an uncertainty navigator, but also an ambiguity explorer the confronter of ambiguity, then it arises, the surprise. Okay? So today we are talking about how do you develop these entrepreneurial leaders who are multi-dextrous, not just great risk managers, also great uncertainty navigators or ambiguity explorers. And not everybody can do that. Okay? So because of our training, we have been trained very well in risk management. Risk management is absolutely necessary. Right? You, if you don't manage current cash flow, there is no future cash flow. So risk management is the starting point. In addition, it's necessary but not sufficient. In this new environment, you better get trained very well to be an uncertainty navigator or an ambiguity explorer. Okay? But the transition from risk manager to uncertainty navigator to ambiguity 
but very, 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 very few people can make those leaps, learn those skills. So that is the starting point. How do we develop these leaps internally? The good news is that there are great companies who do this all the time. Even 50 years ago, Shell used to take very young people and throw them in distant countries into small regions with small markets for them to go learn how to be a leader. Complete uncertainty. Even if they made mistakes, it didn't really matter. It didn't hurt the company. Right? They developed these leaders and by exposing them to uncertainty and ambiguity. So that's the starting point. So today, there is a much greater need to develop these multi-dextrous entrepreneurial leaders mm -hmm. who understand these distinctions. When do I make decisions, analyze and act? When do I have to act in the absence of data and then analyze? Mm -hmm. so, it, if I may, I just wanted to, to ask a follow-up on that. It's almost, and my apologies, a philosophical question but it's one that we see so often with, with, with our clients. I was working with a biotech in, in the US and they were talking about whether or not a decision that turned out to be wrong had been right given what they knew at the time. So it comes to this, this question of uncertainty and the philosophical question is, um, it, or is it kind of a determinist universe? So if we could have known the right data, we could have made the right decision or do you need to accept something a little bit more Zen, which is no, there is, it's kind of more like quantum mechanics. There is uncertainty in the system. And so what do you think about that, Jay? No, I, in the sense that the way we go into the future is through type one error, type two error. False positives, false negatives. Okay? It's, that is the nature of of the future, isn't it? It's almost tautological. So, so Jay, can you just, just before we go further, can you just remind us type one and type two, Eric, can you an example of each so that we're all, we all, if, if we're kind of thinking, yeah, I've heard of that, but remind me how those two work. So, so this, I gave you the example of Apple and how they created this product called iTools and Dot Mac and, and Mobile Me and iCloud. At every stage, you need to make a decision. Should I kill or should I continue? Based on how much information we have at that moment. And so scientists understand this by nature. So you mentioned biotech and, you know, scientists naturally understand what is experimentation. They're trained to be experimenters, okay? Uh, engineers understand that experiment experimentation, but finance and accounting and legal people don't understand experimentation. They don't, they, many of them cannot even spell the word hypothesis. Okay? So when we say type one error, type two error, is that should I kill or continue a project? Walmart went into Germany, struggled for two years or three years. Should we continue or should we get, get back and get out of it? So all strategy, all innovation has this built-in type one error, type two error. Type one error is we keep going while we should have stopped. Type two error is, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we got out while we should have continued. There is no magical answers for this. This is no there is no beautiful spreadsheet for this, right? So it's at that it's very contextual at that moment. It's the best knowledge we have. What is much more important is do we have a process to manage this type one error, type two error? Okay. And in the past, if we, we kind of just did it on a gut feel, right? But there are companies that manage this very kind of intentionally. If you take Ben and Jerry's, which is an ice cream company, which is a part of Unilever, they're constantly killing products. They constantly keep introducing products, right? But also they let customers go to the website and say, hey, can you bring this product back? Hey, I really liked it, I, I miss it, right? Maybe they killed that product prematurely, right? So how do we manage that, right? 
So in that sense, experimentation, hypothesis testing, in the last five, 10 years, it's becoming more popular because we have great companies like Amazon and Facebook and these digital companies are becoming very good at experimentation and they are teaching the world how to become better experimenters. But in sciences, yes, it's always been there, but in many other industries, that notion of experimentation is foreign to many disciplines like like finance, accounting, legal, and even IT. Okay. And if I remember the, the literature... I don't know if I answered it. Sorry? So I, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but... Yeah, absolutely, and the follow-up is, if I remember the literature, I think there's also an evolu evolutionary bias uh, because our ancestors were... Um, it, it, the ones who uh, didn't run away from something that seemed like a lion, uh, but was, got eaten. Uh, so there was no penalty for being scared of things that you, for, for being wrong in a way, in a kind of a prudent way. And so we kind of have this bias towards, to, towards risk aversion, to running away from things that look threatening. And, and the scientific method of checking is this, you know, you, you can't sit there on the savannas of Africa and say, well, it could be a lion in the long grass. Let me think about this, draw up a hypothesis and let's do an experiment. Those, those, there probably were people like that, but they all got eaten. So we're, we're wired to, 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 to be on one side of, of the type one, type two error divide. And I think beyond just being in finance or being in legal, we have this bias towards some of the negative fantasies that we're kind of hardwired uh, to, 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 to obsess about. And again, uh, it goes back to how good are we as humans from a statistic, statistics perspective, right? You may all have all the data. Look at the anti-vaccine movement. So just because we have data doesn't mean we will make the right decisions. So we know that even under overwhelming evidence, people will reject it. So that is the constant challenge we have as humans. Even if we have data and even if we have information, even if we have knowledge, it doesn't mean we'll change our behaviors. So it doesn't mean we'll change our mindset. Okay? So that is who we are as humans. Is, and I think it was Peter Drucker who said, we just, we humans are very stubborn. Or I think, no, I think it was Daniel Kahneman, right? We are not dumb, it's just that we are very stubborn. We have all kinds of biases and somehow magically statistics doesn't apply to me for everybody else. So. Nick, another question or? No, back to you, Didi. I think we, I, it was a sidetrack, but an interesting one about, about ambiguity. But I, I think we, we, we were talking also about VUCA in general. I think there's yeah. probably um, there's one, one thing that, that I talk quite a bit today to executives in this environment of VUCA. What is the role of the executives? Okay. What, are the, what is the role of these leaders, entrepreneurial leaders? The term VUCA has been primarily used for the external environment. Right? It is volatility, competitive volatility, or or say even uh, government volatility, uh, you know, legal kind of uh, volatility or complexity or ambiguity. It's all, somehow always we have used the term VUCA comes because of the external environment. And somehow leaders have to develop these expertise to deal with this external VUCA. What leaders don't talk a lot about is internal VUCA. That is the volatility, the ambiguity, the uncertainty that they cause inside the company. Constant changes in leadership, indecision, poor articulation, bad storytelling, okay? constant changing of strategies. So 
there is a lot of internal volatility as well that happens inside companies. Okay. And especially when there is disruption coming from the external environment. So at this time of that pandemic, we all understand that external VUCA, the global external VUCA that's happening. So what is the job of the leaders? What's the job of the executives? If you have internal VUCA, in addition to that external VUCA, you will burn out your people. Okay? You will almost kill your companies. So today, the job of the executives, the entrepreneurial leaders, is to decrease the internal VUCA because employees are hungry for some level of stability, some level of certainty. They want an oasis of some comfort because there is so much external VUCA in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their cities. And that's what the great companies are doing today, is that the great companies are saying, hey, we, we will help you. We will make sure that we don't add to this external VUCA. So how can we kind of help you make sure that you are at least finding some solace working in a company that protects you from that external VUCA? So if the internal VUCA and you have external VUCA, it's a faster, you, you faster road to death. Okay. So this is something that you don't hear much about creating these islands where people can kind of come and say, hey, you know what? I love to come here because there is some semblance of sanity during this time of the pandemic. Okay. So I urge all leaders to think about that. Are we taking a pulse on our internal? How can I reduce that? Jay, thank you for that. I, I, I'm, it really speaks to me as, as uh, Nick would imagine, because that's, that's one of the things we see a lot uh, with, with, with our clients who are all confronted to, to, to this, let's call it, VUCA world of disruption. I love the distinction you make between external circumstances, VUCA, and internal VUCA. I love what you advise. Uh, one thing is to fight the outside VUCA. I just wrote a, a paper recently, and, and I'd like to check with you if we are on the same wavelength or if you have something very different in mind. As you do know, I, I work, uh, I happen to work with professional uh, football or soccer for the Americans. Um, but for the, for the half Colombian that you are, <laughs> we can call it football. And, um, and, and to me, in a, football, on, in a football team, the outside VUCA would be to be obsessed by what the other team are doing. They should be defending, they're attacking, they should be on the left, they're on the right. Uh, so that's the VUCA world. That's how they, how, how they play in an unexpected way. They have the morale. We don't have the morale then. So that would be the outside. But what I hear you say as well is a team that would win is a team that will not adapt to what the other team is doing, but will impose their serenity, their calmness, their determination. And one step further, when we've been studying, and it's mainly the, the coach I work with, Fabio Celestini, has been studying with the University of Rome who are specialists in what you know are complex adaptive system theory. They try to, to combine what would it be in, in soccer, in football. And they said it's pretty much like the flock of birds or the school of fishes. Very one, two, three maximum simple rules. Those birds that fly sometimes 6,000 together have one rule, follow the guy that's in front of you and make sure you don't bump into the others, keep the distance. And that's how they manage to avoid uh, eagles, uh, falcons, uh, attack, whatever. They don't think of the falcon, they just follow. 
the guy uh, or the girl in front of them. Um, so that's one thing. I, I don't know if on this one you have already a reaction. Are we talking the same thing or am I, did I smoke yeah. the, yeah. the no, carpet? I, I, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And it, there is historical you know, research around this. Uh, even if you go back to the internal locus of control versus external locus of control in psychology, right? Entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial leaders always have a much better internal locus of control in the sense that my decisions, what takes me to the next level, okay? I'm responsible for the outcomes of my action. Okay? That where I will take this company is because of my decisions. Rather than people who have an external locus of control are always blaming somebody else. Say, hey, my government controls me or my, you know, boss controls me or my wife controls me or whatever that, that religion controls me. Right? So, so if you take the individual, entrepreneurial leaders tend to have a much better internal locus of control. Okay? And now if you kind of extend it to a corporation or even a team, today we are talking of psychological safety. What's that climate that you create in a small group for us to be very high performance levels or even high creativity levels? Right? So that is in a, in a smaller setting. But if you extend it to the larger enterprise, we have culture. So the enterprise culture, is it supportive or is it confrontational? Okay. And there are strong cultures, there are weak cultures, there are all kinds of different ways of thinking about culture today. Okay. So when we say climate is a part of culture, right. and, and when you say, hey, am I excited to get up and go to work today? Is you're asking that question. How I feel in that group. So Absolutely, and and I totally agree with you in the sense that, you know, how do these groups perform at their best levels? And from from Mahali, Chuskan Mahali, the notion of flow in the zone, it's a lot has to do with the internal rather than the external, isn't it? Okay. And so again, we have to be a little careful. It's not, it's not so dichotomous as internal or external, okay? Because culture of an enterprise is a reflection of how it adapts to the environment, okay? Why do we say French culture or Swiss culture? Because you have adapted over time and it's still successful. So it's a reflection, constant reflection of adaptation to your external environment. How my values, how my behaviors, and the climates that the climate that I create internally, it cannot be completely devoid of the realities of trying to put together resources, working on projects and processes, and how do we create products for customers and generate cash flow. You can't separate the two out, okay? They're highly interlinked. Culture is this amalgam of highly interconnected building blocks, okay? One is the business side. We, we as different people speaking different languages of finance, accounting, legal operations, strategy, we are all speaking different languages, but we are all coming together to gather resources and then we are working on projects and processes, which are our sausage making machine and open products to specific customers and that generate cash flow. That's the business side. But we are all doing with our values, our behaviors, our climate. So the left hand side, the sausage making machine may not be unique, but culture is always unique because culture is about how we got to where we are today, 
So it's about our history, how we adapted to all the external changes and how we succeeded. Okay. And so it is that toggle. And so yes, we need both. We need that in, intense internal locus of control, or what we call as at the individual level, internal locus of control, at the company level, it's that culture, but it's that constant adaptation to that external environment. Jay, I want to be very quickly just a bit provocative on that, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're not saying something, but I want to check and really spell it out, because uh, the, the VUCA world, external VUCA world, and reducing VUCA control inside, it, it's appealing to me as it is to Didier, it makes sense. But then I'm thinking, what about a kind of very old fashioned company, um, maybe a European company with industrial knowledge and there's a VUCA world out there, the temptation to protect inside, to reduce VUCA, but effectively to rearrange the chairs on the Titanic. Say, don't worry guys, we still have internal control. We can outlast this. I don't think that's what you're saying, but I just want to- I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm glad you- as a clarifying question, okay? Because we can get into what we call as FDH, dumb and happy, okay? If you look at all companies that have been disrupted, got into that framework, if you look at even a short time period, even after iPhone came out, for three years, BlackBerry was growing. Their salespeople were getting the best bonuses ever. Okay. And even when the internet was in its nascent, the World Wide Web was at its nascent level for 10 years, the newspaper industry, the ad revenues were growing. Okay. So, so disruption at times is very deceptive. So it's very easy to fall victim to, hey, you know what, this thing is not really going to hurt us. Because, hey, this has been around 10 years and you're going to tell, and I have hit my numbers every year and I have grown every year. So great financial performance today doesn't mean great strategy. Vice versa, poor performance today doesn't mean bad strategy. Okay, so that's why I say, hey, don't, don't make decisions purely based on today's reality. So you have to be very careful about it. So many times when a company is highly complacent, they've fallen into that complacency. Leaders are brought in to give the company a cheetah. A cheetah is a kick in the ass. So my wise mentor, the sergeant say, many times the company needs a jolt because they fall victim to that Today, everything is fine today. Okay. By the time it impacts me, I'll be long retired. <laughs> See? So, absolutely. I'm thanks for clarifying that because I did not mean that. <laughs> thank you, Nick. Um, thank you, Jay. I'm, you know, we're coming to the end already of our conversation, but I'd like to check with you if um, my abusive simplification of what I heard is, is, is really in line with your message. What I take away from, from this discussion for us, uh, but more important for those who listen to us and to our clients, is that if we go back to the end of the discussion, the VUCA world, there is an outside component. And I think you talked about dealing with that outside component in the first part of your intervention. Everything that has to do with debunking the myth of creativity with uh, innovation can come also and not only out of luck. Uh, the, the, what you were talking about um, when we talked about the blue ocean strategy, structured problem solving. So don't believe that everything's going to come without you know effortless etc you know, all, all all these challenges you brought about the normal way the myth of of creativity and when it came to talk about 
further about VUCA, you said there's also an internal VUCA. So don't let the outside VUCA influence you. Uh, it's not a good idea to have a complex organization to fight the complexity. It's even worse to have a complicated organization to fight against complexity. Keep it simple, keep it, you know, the complex adaptive system that we talked about. So if, am, am I, am, did, did I capture or am I, am I missing something? And, you know, and I apologize, it's an over -sim abusive simplification of an hour and a half discussion or so, but am, am I forgetting something? Is there, am I on the right, wrong track? Uh, no, I think I think it's a good summary, right, of, of the various issues we have talked about, right, and and perhaps the one thing that I would add is that um, the notion of how of leadership has evolved, yeah, especially in the West, right, of uh, our understanding of leadership, it's all most of it, how we get trained in business schools, how we kind of go about talking about leadership uh, globally, the majority of the influences come from the West. The models, the frameworks, the research. Not only from the West, but from men. So this is where the world is significantly going to be changing. Today, I just read, today, uh, Wall Street Journal mentioned that for the first time, Wharton Business School has more women than men. Okay. It's a big school. Right? And Warren Buffett has been talking about this for, for years now. They just haven't had the women. They have left out 50% of humanity when it comes to uh, strategy, leadership, uh, uh, entrepreneurship, <laughs> you name it. We still design cars for men. <laughs> okay. I'm sure if you were to have women designers, they would design it incredibly differently. So, well, how is it that we will be changing significantly, and how will we incorporate it into the into our journey? Many things are known. The demographics are known. So today, there's a duality of thinking. India and China think executives think so differently from from the Occident. So that duality of Orient and Occident didn't exist in, in our executive training or our, right? So I, I have been super lucky. I've been just pure luck. I'm, my body is Hindu, my body is Indian, right? So all my traditional education has been America, US centric somehow magically for 15 years, I got to deal with Swiss companies, Swedish companies, Spanish companies. And so executives taught me how to think very differently from the American way of thinking. And my heart, as you know, is, is Latin. I work a lot with Latin companies. And so, and, and for the last 10 years, I've been going to China to understand how executives think there still working with Indian companies as well. So I have been amazed at the, not just the, the not just the dichotomy, but the, the multi-dimensional way of executives think and act. And we still want to leverage that because a lot of the research and the formulas and the frameworks are still coming from the West. So they all look up to the West towards this, and I'm I'm saying no, no, no. There's, there's a lot that the world has to offer in, in terms of thinking. Uh, entrepreneurially, entrepreneurial leaders are everywhere. Thank you, Jay. That that is that is very very helpful and useful, and I think it opens other 
uh, other thoughts in my mind when I listen to you. Nick, would you like to add question something more? I think I think I'm going to try and resist that temptation. We've had a fantastic, like you, I'm thinking we could go on another hour now, but uh, but no, I will. Uh, that, that it's been fantastic. It almost sounded like great concluding uh, words from Jay. So uh, no, I'm I'm good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I just absolutely love your questions. Thank you very much, Jay. And uh, have a very, very good day there in the US. <laughs> Ours is, <laughs> is coming to an end, but thank you very much. And I think it's, uh, it will be very much appreciated by both our clients and, and by the people who have the kindness to follow our, our um, YouTube chain. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.